people can join. Um, our speaker today is Deborah Page Dumrose. Um, Debbie is a senior research soil scientist with the Rocky Mountain Research Station that is located in uh, Moscow, Idaho. Is it Idaho, Debbie? Yeah, okay. Uh, her work is centered around providing land managers with data that supports minimizing soil impacts from harvest operations and slash pile burning. She installed one of the first four North American long-term soil productivity sites and continues core measurements and upkeep on three sites scattered in the Pacific Northwest. She also does work on creating and applying biochar across a wide range of soils and is involved with determining how land management affects surface and below ground decomposition rates. And uh, Deb's title is the North American Long-Term Soil Productivity Experiment. Is it still relevant after 30 years? Over to you, Deb. There we go. All right, I'm gonna assume that you can see this. Uh, we are seeing the, uh, the, oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay, let me back up. So, so thank you, Lisa. And, and I do want to thank the organizers of this meeting. It has been such a wonderful meeting. Uh, you know, I've, I've learned a lot of new things. I've seen some people in the gather room. Um, and I, I just, I think it's been well organized. And, you know, it's, it's hard to do a virtual meeting. I understand that. But I think this has been one of the best I've been to. So thank you so much for um, all your efforts to get this organized and get us underway. So I appreciate that. So yeah, today I'm gonna to talk about the North American Long-Term Soil Productivity Study. And I have on my title slide two plus decades, but you know, some of the oldest sites are um, nearing 35 years old. And some of those sites are in the Southeastern United States and are ready for harvesting. And um, so that presents some, some new opportunities that I think um, the LTSP group can take advantage of. <clears throat> you know, um, usually, you know, People acknowledge um, all of their co-authors, and to be honest, I could never do that. There have been hundreds of people involved in this LTSP work um, over the decades, and um, you know the Forest Service in the United States. Um, there's been a, a quite a few organizations in Canada who have been involved. Our industry collaborators have either put in um, the entire experimental design or are listed as affiliate sites. We've had um, scores of universities that have been involved with graduate students or with sites. Um, there are sites in New Zealand and in China now. And, um, and you can see, uh, we, we have started out as a pretty large group and um, you know, a lot of the people have um, retired or passed away. Um, we're all getting a little grayer, right? <laughs> but um, you know, none of this work would be possible without the guidance, the foresight, the vision, the enthusiasm, and the tenacity of Bob Powers. He was really instrumental um, in the United States in moving this forward from um, an idea to uh, reality. And so, um, you know, I think all of us who are involved with the LTSP program are indebted to his um, hard work. So today, I, I, you know, I really want to tell you the story. Um, and, and hopefully that story will help spark some ideas in your mind about how you could be involved in the LTSP study. Um, I, I want to give you the background so you understand um, why it was so important that the LTSP study get started, um, what it looks like um, you know, on the ground, and then just a few tidbits about what we've learned. But I really want to highlight at the end um, the lessons that we've learned and um, the opportunities that there are to get involved in the larger um, network of sites. So how it all started. It's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a story, but it's an interesting one. And so I think you'll enjoy it. So uh, this started in the United States and um, we have a history of some soil policies in the United States that have had really brought us to an inflection point. And one of those um, of course was the Organic Act. And it was really about providing um, water flow and forest protection, but also supplying timber. And another key law that followed that was the Multiple Use Sustain Yield Act. And um, it was about, you know, the 1960s when we realized that forests weren't just for growing trees, but also provided a lot of recreation and wildlife and aesthetic and spiritual values that um, we needed to make sure were protected on national forests. And so um, this act worked to do that. Um, one of the key pieces of language in there was that it said without impairment to the productivity of the land. And then um, nine years later, the National Environmental Policy Act follows. And, um, and that act really um, wanted people to think about what the proposed 
usually timber harvest, but proposed actions on forest lands would be in relation to both short-term and long-term productivity? And could there be a way to enhance productivity? So that set us on a course, um, but then in the early or the late 60s, early 70s, um, we had some sites that looked like this. This is the Bitterroot National Forest in Montana. And after harvesting, these sites were terraced. And, and while the goal was, the, the objective of this was, you know, pretty sound. They wanted to increase um, water holding capacity on some pretty crappy soils. Um, it, it, look, it looks really bad, right? Um, and, and then um, at about the same time on the Monongah, that, so that's in the West, and in the Eastern United States on the Monongahela National Forest, they had some large scale clear cuts with lots of roads and lots of skid trails. Um, and, it, and if you're somebody in the public, this does not look like something that you want in your backyard, right? So people complain and eventually legislatures um, respond. And we ended up with the National Forest Management Act in 1976, which said that harvesting timber could only be done where the soil would not be irreversibly damaged. You know, there are a whole host of other things in that law, but um, for us and for um, the work that we were about to embark on, uh, this was really a key piece of legislation that um, kind of set the stage for what was to follow. And, and what was to follow was that, um, the public really became aware that um, understanding the links between soil and forest growth were key, that soil management was the underpinning of sustainable forest management. And um, we were beginning to understand that, of course, if you disturb the soil, you affect sustainable productivity. And it varied from place to place, right? It wasn't the same everywhere. And so the National Forest Management Act really um, set us on a path of requiring research and monitoring that were to protect the permanent productivity of national forests. Um, and so you can see that um, with this law, there was also um, more awareness by the public that um, they should be keeping an eye on what was happening on their national forests. And so, um, you know, part of the issue here is that um, in the past, we had just been using tree measurements to uh, uh, say, well, um, we didn't affect productivity, or um, we can't really say if we affected productivity because we didn't really have any reference stands. And we, of course, were measuring trees that were at different stand ages and different stand structures. There was a different treatment history. Um, we had different stocking levels. And so relating um, how forest management and soil properties and permanent productivity um, were linked was really difficult. And so what happened is that the Forest Service settled on some soil-based indices that were um, a bit more objective and could maybe link that piece between um, soil productivity and stand productivity. And so um, we were the first agency to develop soil quality standards. And they were designed to um, look at the effects of management and they were to meet the direction of that National Forest Management Act and the other legal mandates. Um, and so um, it, it was an interesting process. The U.S. Forest Service um, at our headquarters said all of the Forest Service regions um, would design forest um, soil quality standards. And for example, they could be um, an increase in 20% uh, blood density or that the aerial extent of disturbance couldn't be greater than 20% or you couldn't reduce infiltration by greater than 20%. These were examples sent out um, and they were, you know, just ideas, you know, here's some things that you could use. But every, almost every single region in the Forest Service thought those were the greatest things since sliced bread and decided that they would use those. Um, and so what happened is that then we had a standard metric for almost all soils. Um, and these thresholds that were selected um, really were just best judgment. They, there was no science to say they were backing these up. Um, and, and, and key to this was that they were supposed to be early warnings and not absolute. But what happened is that they became absolutes. And a lot of forest soil scientists at the time um, ended up being more like um, soil cops rather than soil scientists saying, you know, this, this type of harvest activity wasn't the best um, and here's what happened. And so could we adjust how we 
um, how we harvest the same kind of soil under the same conditions with the same equipment the next time we do this. It was really more of a, no, we're gonna shut down harvest operations. And you know, so that's not very good either. So, um, so these early warnings became absolutes. Some people had a sliding scale, some people had black and white, um, and all of this um, resulted in quite a few lawsuits against the Forest Service because we could not still, we still could not show that we were maintaining long-term productivity. So this, this is a problem, right? You know, how do you, um, you know, get to that point where, um, you know, we're, we're making changes and we're, um, we're not getting sued and we're showing the public that we're, we have their best interest in mind. Um, we, we just, we couldn't do it. And it was getting worse and worse. And, you know, Montana and Idaho were some of the worst places for lawsuits. Um, there was a strong cadre of people who really had the land ethic that, um, you know, there should be no disturbance. And, um, and so we kind of had to backpedal. Well, so then this led to some discussions. And I, I know you all have been on field tours and have had some really rich conversations in the bus on the way to your field tour site. And, and in the 1980s, early 1980s, this was um, the, the case. It was some Washington office soil scientists and some research and development people. So it was our management side and our research and development side who had this conversation in the back of the bus about the, the problems with lawsuits, the problems with not having soil quality standards that were able to address um, the problems of timber harvesting. We didn't know how to address the early standards because they weren't validated. Um, and, you know, so uh, the idea was born that there could be this network of sites on a variety of soil types and timber types that could begin to explore um, the long-term effects of compaction and organic matter removal. And, um, you know, this site, um, the best way for us to do this was to pilot it on some experimental forest in the Forest Service. These are areas that we don't really have to have a lot of um, paperwork done ahead of time. We don't have to do that, um, didn't have to do at that time, the proposed action impacts and we could, it was easier for us to get these sites installed. So um, the four experimental sites were um, in California. I had one here in Idaho. Um, there was one in Minnesota and one in Louisiana. And so we had a variety of sites. And as those started to come online, more and more people um, could really got engaged in the LTSP um, program. And so now we're at a, a place where this is um, the largest coordinated long-term forest management study uh, in the world, um, you know, because we're linking in both soil and forest management issues. Um, yeah, of course, it was initiated by the Forest Service in the United States, but now it's international. We have over 100 field sites, and we have this shared study design and core monitoring plots that help us, um, you know, try and share some of similar data across sites, and you'll see how that's important in a little bit. And, and so part of this also is providing research on forest management, and what is the productive capacity of the land, and how is that altered um, with compaction or organic matter removal. And this has helped us develop um, and validate those soil quality standards. In some cases, the soil quality standards have been changed. Some of them, um, instead of standards, they're now guidelines. Um, and we have a new monitoring um, protocol in the United States for national forests that um, really kind of looks at um, what are those key indicators of changes in productivity. So here is the network of sites. We, um, we have quite a few and, um, you know, there, there's a big hole in the center of North America where we don't have any, but um, not a lot of forest there at the time when all of this was installed. But part of this, um, these linkages are where are the soil scientists who are interested in this long-term um, study and um, how can we engage with them? And, and yeah, we're bringing on new um, researchers all the time and, um, and we should be able to you know, hopefully continue this on into the future. You know, the, the whole goal of LTSP was to um, have this study go for an entire rotation. And, and like I said earlier, um, in the Southeast, um, at 35 years, they're at the end of their rotation and will be harvesting. But my hope is that um, on some of those sites, you could look at, um, you know, what is the effect of repeated entries and, and how does that affect long-term productivity as well.
So um, you know, there's still some interesting questions that we can answer with this work. So the core hypotheses. The core hypotheses had been um, that this change in site organic matter and soil porosity um, would not affect long-term productivity. Um, and if they did occur, they would be universal and they would be irreversible. And that plant community diversity had no impact on long-term productivity. So, so let's look at the, the treatments for just a second. So um, it was really three levels of organic matter removal and three levels of soil porosity loss or compaction. Um, and the organic matter removal piece was, um, is it just um, bowl only harvesting and all of the tops were left on the site? Um, whole tree harvesting, so take the whole tree off, right? Um, or whole tree harvesting and removal of the forest floor. Soil porosity um, is a little um, bit different. Yeah, it's just high, medium, and low. We tried to shoot for um, within 20% of the root limiting bulk density, and I'm going to talk about that in a couple of minutes as well. Um, and, and then um, on, on several sites, um, not everywhere, but we do have um, 0.4 hectare plots that um, were divided in half, and half had herbicide control and half didn't. So this gets at that plant diversity issue. Um, you know, is it important to have the shrubs and the understory present on these sites to um, have a biodiversity and uh, maintain that soil processes below ground, or is it just that we're looking at tree growth? And so when I started this, um, I was a newly minted PhD, newly minted scientist um, at then at the Intermountain Research Station in Idaho. Um, I really, you know, I was, I thought this was a really a, a great way to start my career. <laughs> um, and, um, and, you know, I kind of had that pie in the sky. It was kind of like the magic of forest, right? You know, oh, yeah, well, yeah, we can do this, that, no problem, you know? And, and Bob Powers was a great salesman, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, this be no problem, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I really had a reality check. Probably all of the site installation people had a reality check um, when they started to do this work. And, um, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, for once, all of the plots were laid out. So there were, um, you know, it was a three by three factorial. So one replicate was nine plots. Um, most people put in three plots except at these pilot sites. Um, and, and we laid out the plots and um, every 20 meters within this 0.4 hectare plot um, had a uh, sample taken. And so there were 16 of these points within that 0.4 hectare area. Um, we collected forest floor and um, I hope you can see there's some rings um, around this square litter box. That's where litter is being collected. Um, and so in the center ring, we um, collected all of the grasses and forbs, and in the outer ring, it was um, shrubs and saplings. And then um, in the area around that, we also collected data on tree sapling growth and um, you know, what was in the understory. Um, so, um, so that was the beginning. And then, of course, we had to take bulk density cores, right? Um, and they were taken um, to 30 centimeter depth on most sites and, um, you know, I'm sure all of you have taken a bulk density core in your life. And so, you know, that they can be challenging when you get past the zero to 10 mark. Um, and then um, what on a lot of sites, we didn't really have good um, data on tree growth. And so in each 0.4 hectare plot, um, all of the trees were measured and we had diameter. And so we divided those diameter classes into thirds and we cut a tree down from each third diameter class. And then at every two meters up the tree, we would take out a cookie. And um, you can see the cookies laid out here in this lower picture. Um, all of those cookies came back to the lab. We extracted a wedge from those. We um, did nutrient analysis and we also counted tree rings. Um, and so we could build these biomass equations for um, trees growing um, on, on all of our plots. Um, we also collected twigs and sticks. Um, we bagged up everything. Uh, we collected needles and um, weighed them all. We put them in bags and we transported them back to our laboratories. And, um, you know, in some places, and this is a picture from California, um, you know, it's nice and sunny most of the year round. The rest of us tried to stuff these uh, bags into storage facilities that, <laughs> you know, would hopefully hold them until we had a chance to grind them and analyze them. Um, it was it was quite a process. So 
pre-harvest work gets done. And then we have to start the, the logging operation. And so during the harvest operations, we did not want any equipment out on our plots because we didn't want the mixing of organic matter with the mineral soil. We didn't want extra compaction or tracks. And so all of the trees were directionally felled. And here's a plot. You can see the directionally felled trees. So these were, um, in, in my case, they were lifted up and moved off site. Um, in some cases, they had to be dragged off site, but um, we tried to minimize the amount of impact. And you can see that there are some logs supporting other trees so that they weren't slamming into the ground. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, my bubble burst early on with this, <laughs> this field process, right? And so then we have to get ready to do the treatments. And um, here we're getting ready to do the compaction treatment. Um, it was difficult. Um, and so the first thing we had to do, because we didn't want to mix the organic horizons in with the mineral soil during compaction, the organic horizons had to be removed on those plots that were compacted either moderately or severely. So that was piled. Um, and then we compacted. Um, as uniformly as possible. And, and that, was, that was the key. You know, these treatments aren't what management would do, but they're a continuum of what we see on harvest sites, right? We see severe compaction, moderate compaction, no compaction. We see sites that have some organic matter removed, some where the forest floor is removed, some where there's a lot of slash. Um, and so these, these treatments aren't meant to mimic what management does, but to um, really encompass that whole continuum. And so um, we, you know, we compacted however was convenient. Um, so here's a um, asphalt roller on this site. It also um, rolled the stumps into the soil. Um, sometimes it was just a plate compactor. Um, here you can see where we've lost the depth of the mineral soil through the compaction effort. Um, and yeah, we were pretty good at making a parking lot out of a forest site <laughs> after a little bit of work. Um, and, you know, of course, we had to have a little fun. There were, um, you know, compaction rodeos going on. <laughs> so all working on one plot at the same time to try and get this done. And I do want to mention that these sites, in most cases, were done when um, water moisture was um, right around field capacity so that we could maximize the amount of compaction that we had. And so, yeah, you know, it was, uh, it was kind of a moonscape after we got done um, putting in some of these plots. And so compaction gets done and we have to put the organic matter back. Um, you know, they really, you know, the crews that I had really did a great job working to get it uniformly distributed. Um, and then um, you know, putting the coarse wood back onto the site was the next step. So it looked like we weren't even there, right? So um, yeah, yeah, we, we, we were. Um, so, so I mentioned earlier this um, root limiting bulk density and um, in 1983, Dato and Warrington had come out with this textural triangle that pointed out where the root limiting bulk density was for um, different soil texture types. Um, and in some cases, we used this to kind of target where our compaction level might be um, for limiting root growth. Um, I'll point out that on the loamy sand soils down in the left-hand corner, you can see that bulk density was 1.75 is the root limiting bulk density. Um, and then the next line up is um, 1.65. Um, I'm not sure that um, in a, most cases we ever achieved that high of a bulk density. Um, and part of the problem is that this textural triangle was developed um, on agricultural soils um, that had no rocks and that were pretty low in organic matter to begin with. And so that created a problem for you know, trying to translate this work into what we were doing on forest sites. But we did compact. Um, and you can see um, the change in bulk density um, on the y-axis and the original bulk density on the x-axis. And um, this was work that I had published back in 2006 using um, uh, about 26 of our sites. Um, I, I'll point out that the, at uh, 0.5 megagrams per meter cubed, um, I had a 60% increase in my ash cap soils. These are fine textured soils that um, are ashy um, and they're like pixie sticks and they're really easy to compact. And, um, you know, we were really worried that we couldn't get root limiting bulk density, you know, and that 
triangle that I showed you, they don't have volcanic ash soils listed. Um, and, and so we were just kind of shooting from the hip and didn't really know what to expect. But our high severity plots, we did compact the soil. I still am not sure that we had a root limiting bulk density, but um, we did have some um, effects that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but you'll also notice that um, overall, some of the highest compaction that we were able to achieve was only 1.5. So remember, I pointed out that um, root limiting bulk density on some sites was 1.75, 1.65. Um, so what had happened is that um, on a lot, of, well, on several of our sites, particularly in the Southwest that were sandy, um, we really only increased bulk density by five or 10%. We didn't get close to being within 20% of the root limiting bulk density. Um, and I, I will say that those sites were the fastest to recover. Within four or five years, they had recovered back to their pre-disturbance bulk density. Um, on other sites, the, um, the soil compaction level has um, been reduced in the surface, uh, five to 10 centimeters, but certainly not at depth. And we think that this long-term change in bulk density at depth is, could really be a problem, right? Because if, if you're not recovering during a rotation and then you compact the soil again, this could compound the compaction um, at depth, but also at the soil surface. So um, I think that's a key piece that we could take away is that there, you know, the recovery times between surface and subsurface are of course different. And it's, under, it's really key to understand what those textual differences might be. And so, um, so then organic matter removal. This is the easy piece, right? <laughs> Mostly. So bowl only, we left the slash on the site unless we were compacting the soil. Um, whole tree harvesting, whole trees got removed. And then um, the forest floor removal, you know, you can see this was really the hardest part. Some people use wheelbarrows. Um, I was lucky enough to have a grappler on site that could um, scoop up most of the organic matter and then um, had some fire crews that could um, rake all the rest from around the stumps. Um, in some places, they were able to use um, minimum security prisoners that were at a nearby prison, had them come out, paid them for their work, and um, got some great work done that way. Um, you know, it was just uh, whatever's available and however you can get it done, um, we were able to get these plots installed. And I do want to mention, and I think this is key um, for moving forward with a lot of the work, is that um, there are some productivity gradients. So some are um, located across the North America, right? Um, we have um, you know, Canada, Louisiana, Fall River highlighted here, but um, there is a continuum of soil conditions. But there's also um, within uh, one PI might have a continuum of productivity gradients as well. So of course, Bob Powers was um, one of the first to have his productivity gradient across um, a large range of soil types in the Sierra Nevadas in California. And, and those are really important for thinking about um, where have we lost productivity or gained productivity um, as we move forward. So I just I wanna point out a few things from some early work that has informed some of the later um, results that we've been um, highlighting or we'll, that we'll, we'll talk about. So organic matter. Um, or, organic matter removal seems to be probably the most important when maintaining productivity. So here you can see there's a variety of sites across the US at age 10 um, and stand productivity declines slightly as you take off whole trees and as you take off whole trees plus forest floor, they decline even further. Um, and, and, and this isn't just limited to these sites. Um, we've seen it on other sites, um, particularly in the US. I'm guessing that Canada, the Canadian sites are the same way. And we could talk about that in the discussion at the end too. Um, and here's some sites from the jack pine at 15 years. Um, these are in Canada. Um, so, you know, you don't really see much of a decline at age 10, but at age 15, you do see a greater decline in um, productivity as the forest floor is removed. And, and I want to point out that this age difference could be really important because in a lot of areas, um, we um, certify that a stand is um, free to grow at age five. And so that, from what we're seeing with the long-term study, is that um, that might not be sufficient to talk about where there might be a productivity drop-off and that these 
productivity changes might be occurring later in the um, stand succession than at year five or 10, you know, so now we see it at 15, but what, what will really happen at um, 20 and 25 and 30 and 35? That's why most of us are still pretty dedicated to seeing this through for our entire careers because we want to get those answers and talk about what those long-term effects might be. So here's another example of um, what, what's possible. You know, we, we didn't really see a change, a non-significant change in productivity um, at age 10. But at age 15, we had we start to see a 7% fall off in, in uh, stand volume. And so again, it's that, you know, those key pieces of information that we don't see in the early stand assessments. Um, here's some work from Dave Morris from 15-year um, black spruce stem volume and, and soil texture. Um, I think this is also a key piece. It's not just the time but it's also the soil texture and and where do we see changes and um we we see um you know this productivity gradient happening with um, not only organic matter removal but also with um compaction and and so i think those are some key things to keep in mind I mean, you know like i said down in the southeast um, on those sandy soils they had recovered pretty well and um, we're back to pre-disturbance bulk density but it's the loss of the forest floor that's really key on fine textured soils, that compaction that hasn't recovered even in um, areas that have a free saw cycle, um, you know, we're still seeing impacts of compaction, both compaction and organic matter removal. So let's think a little bit about um, some of the compaction lessons that we've learned. Um, you know, like I said, compaction hadn't really been a big issue at age 10. Um, in fact, we were seeing um, on some sites that compacted soils actually had better growth. And so, um, you know, part of that is we change pore size distribution. So you have um, more small pores on sites that um, were, um, were compacted. And, um, and so, you know, you know, there's a variety of reasons, but I think the key piece is that, um, you know, Overall, we didn't see a lot of negative effects of compaction, but on individual sites we did. And here's an example of some individual site compaction um, changes. These are from California. And, and I wanna point out, so here's clay on the left, um, stem volume is on the y-axis and years are across the bottom. And you know, so at the first measurement, the clay soil stem volume was similar. Um, but over time, you start to see that the non-compacted soils are, have higher growth than the compacted soils. So this is on clay. You move to the center panel on loam. Um, it's the same stem volume on the y-axis, years across the bottom. Really no difference in tree growth with compacted or non-compacted soils. And then you move to the sandy loam, right? What we were talking about, um, here's the compacted. They're actually growing better at less than 10 years old stand than the non-compacted soils. So, you know, it, you have, up until this time, we kind of had a sense of this, but to be able to look at all these soil textures with the same kind of treatments across a wide range of sites was a really, you know, it's a key finding for LTSP to be able to talk to this issue that we knew was probably happening, but we didn't have the data to support at the time. And so, um, you know, here again, you can see the, um, the big issue is days with available water. And, um, you know, here in the Western United States, this is one of our key issues, particularly as climate changes. And as we um, get longer and longer droughts during the growing season. Um, so we're, um, you know, where we see a drop off in available water is where we often see the drop off in productivity. And, you know, this, this sandy loam, um, bright green uh, bar here is, you know, really indicative of why we see that growth increase on the compacted soils um, early on in this in that stand history. You know, not much of a fall off here in the loam, but you, know, you see this in the clay. And you know, with the smaller and smaller um, pore sizes in the clay, then you really see that difference in what the tree is able to extract. And, and one of the things that we've noticed um, on, uh, that I noticed on my sites, um, particularly on the ones that had herbicide versus non-herbicide, was that on those sites that did not have compaction, um, the understory um, 
and that had a forest floor, the understory stayed green longer into the growing season. So as that drought started to set in, um, we were able to keep the vegetation green longer, which is a great thing for wildlife, um, for just keeping the stand green and being resilient to fire. So I wanna highlight some longer term lessons learned. Um, we've learned that herbicides might not result in a continual increase in tree volume. So these herbicides were only applied for the first several years. And um, while they did result in some increases in tree growth early on, we didn't see that, um, that increased tree growth continuing over time. Um, and as I've mentioned, the maintenance of surface organic horizons is really critical. Um, we, we really um, have focused in on, you know, it's critical for long-term tree growth, it's carbon storage, it's that water conservation piece, you know, the mulch on the soil surface. Um, it's the nutrient retention and cycling. There's been um, quite a few papers from LTSP published on just, you know, the nutrient cycling piece and the carbon storage piece. Um, but there's also been quite a few on this microbial function and community changes um, when you take off the forest floor. And, and that seems to be um, really, you know, key for maintaining long-term productivity. Um, here's some other examples of what we've learned that um, surface organic matter, uh, surface compaction has generally recovered. And, you know, we've talked about this a couple of times that um, it's that, you know, the surface five centimeters or so have recovered, maybe down to 10 centimeters, but that deep compaction has remained relatively unchanged. And, this compounds loss of water retention or ponding on sites that are prone to ponding, like this one in the picture. <laughs> um, it's a soil aeration problem, root growth issue, and a microbial activity problem. And so, um, you know, I think um, you know what what we um, what we've learned from all of this is that um, it's better to um, you know avoid these problems than to try and mitigate it afterwards. You know, because in a lot of places. Um, we're not ripping skid trails or um, we're not changing the dynamics at log landings. And we end up with, um, you know, relying on natural recovery rates, which can sometimes be pretty slow, particularly at depth in the soil profile. So um, the bottom line, um, yeah, yeah, many sites really are not, um, are, are not, are resilient. Some sites are not. And I think LTSP has been um, one important way that we've been able to distinguish which sites are resilient to harvest and compaction and organic matter removal and which ones are not. And yeah, we've talked about this. It varies by soil and climate and slope and aspect. And all of those things should be taken into account as we plan harvest activities. Um, and, and that's you know some of what that soil monitoring piece can bring to this is that we do these long-term studies um, but we also need to marry that with the monitoring activities that take place on a larger range of sites so that we can begin to pull together which sites are resilient and which sites are not. And, um, and I think, um, you, you know, from my soil background, I think um, part of this has, has been, um, you know, developing those um, ideas or best management practices that um, help us figure out which ones are which, right? And, um, and being able to say, well, you know, on these sites that are not resilient, we need to just do winter logging, or we need to log in the summer when the soils are dry, or we need to avoid these altogether because of whatever issues there might be. And I think that's probably, you know, I think that's a big benefit of these long-term studies is that we're able to inform those management decisions. And so my, my really bottom line <laughs> is that we have been able to develop these best management practices. And as I mentioned, you know, it's, it's the ability to um, avoid soil disturbance rather than trying to mitigate those effects. We, um, you know, on some sites I've seen, we have tried to rip skid trails only to have them recompact um, at about the same level. And, um, and oftentimes that um, ripping has not been effective deep in the soil profile. And so, um, you know, I, I do think that the avoidance rather than mitigation efforts are probably um, where our efforts should be. And, um, you know, I think, um, you know, and I, again, I think that the linkage between what we monitor on sites after harvesting and before harvesting um, really kind of key into this. Um, are we able to avoid soil disturbance and where? 
And, and I, you know, we, um, we have some new opportunities on these old sites. Um, there have been fires on some of our LTSP installations. So now we can look at um, were there um, organic matter and compaction of treatments that were more or less resilient to fire. Um, I have installed um, biochar in some of the buffers of my LTSP plot. So now it's a, can you um, assess changes in soil compaction or organic carbon on those sites where you've taken off all of the organic matter or compacted it and does biochar help remediate that? Um, on some sites that um, I have on the high compaction plots, we have had um, huge outbreaks of disease um, associated with compaction and organic matter removal. Um, and, and so, you know, I think those are places, what are the long-term impacts of those, um, those changes on future disease outbreaks? Um, we know that there, um, there are some sites that were assessed pretty intensely for carbon. Um, I want to say that um, I, there's a grad student at Oregon State right now who is looking at all of my archive samples, reanalyzing them for carbon and looking at the changes in carbon with new sampling. Um, you know, does it change forms? Does it change amounts? Um, and, and where in the profile is that located? And I think that keys into the climate change impacts. Um, I mentioned that there are repeated entry issues that we need to discuss because now, particularly in the Forest Service in the U.S., um, we aren't doing a lot of clear cuts like LTSP was, um, but I think those clear cut areas can inform things like repeated entry. So again, as the Southeast is starting to think about harvesting their LTSP plots, maybe a repeated entry would gather, be able to be a place where you could gather more information about recovery of the soil, recovery of productivity, and what happens when you go in again. And then of course, there's always these multiple disturbances, right? It's um, fire and insects and carbon and climate change all you know, on one site and how, how do you link those and how do you tease apart those multiple disturbances to really get at the, um, what's changing above ground and below ground. And so I, I want to talk for a minute about um, leveraging the science. Uh, you know, I, I hope that um, through all of this, you've been able to um, kind of get a sense of, um, yeah, there's some really cool documented sites out there that, um, you know, could be used for question A or question B, you know, whatever your interest might be. Um, we um, have been able to, um, to talk about residue retention guidelines for bioenergy harvesting. Um, we've been able to get a short-term look at um, soil and tree recovery trajectories after these treatments. Um, in the U.S., we've developed the soil monitoring protocol that could be used across all sites, um, but gives you site-specific information. So we've standardized and made more efficient our soil monitoring protocol. Um, I mentioned the above and below ground carbon stocks are, are really a key piece of what we're gathering now. And I mentioned at the beginning, we've hosted hundreds of graduate student projects. Um, and we've used this data to attract funding so that we could fund these graduate students. Um, I think, I still think that this, these sites are relevant today and could also be used to attract funding um, for a variety of places and, um, you know, across a whole range of uh, productivity gradients that might be of interest to anyone. Um, and so I, I, I can't leave my presentation without highlighting this forest ecology and management uh, book. There's a link here in the slide for you to go to. Um, we did a special issue um, and, you know, at the beginning we, we wrote this sentence that we wanted to incorporate the effects of climate change, fire, erosion, loss of biodiversity above and below ground, invasive species, and other large scale problems that could be addressed by combining um, a variety of sites, however we wanted to, um, or issues into a synthesis paper. And so um, I, I do encourage you, if you haven't already checked out this forest ecology and management uh, special issue, I encourage you to go there and, um, you know, it, it, I feel bad not highlighting all of the work that was in this, but it is a lot of work and we would be here for like hours talking about it and discussing it and, and getting the authors to come and talk. I think that would be kind of fun, but anyway. Um, so, so that's, you know, that's part of um, why we did this issue was because we were at a point 
you know, 25, 20 to 35 years where we could start to pull in this whole range of sites into um, some, some really, I think they're really cool um, syntheses of the, of the data. And so you're probably asking yourself, where is the data? Yeah, that's a good question, right? Um, hopefully it doesn't look like this pile of notebooks here, <laughs> um, but where is the data? Um, we, we did an early attempt to consolidate all of our data on a website. And at this point, it's not active. You know, it was done, I wanna say back in the early 2000s and um, you know, web development isn't what it is today. I'll, I'll just put it that way. Um, but all of our principal investigators have archived soil samples and all of their data, I think, is probably in electronic format. And, um, and everyone associated with this study has been quick to share their data. If you say, I want to write a paper about X, they're more than happy to share that data with you. But I do want to mention that um, this has been a concern with the Forest Service for a long time. You know, we started this and then, um, yeah, you know, we kind of all went our separate ways and we all have piles of data on hard drives or external drives or in file cabinets, dare I say. Um, and so the Forest Service is working on a SharePoint site to make all of this LTSP data available widely. Um, and, and part of what spurs this on is that um, a lot of the principal investigators that started this at the beginning of their careers, like me, um, are getting ready to retire. And, and so how do you make sure that you have a continuity of sites and data to ensure that this long-term study that should go for another 70 years um, will continue and that there'll still be people to pick up the pieces when you're done. So I think that will make um, a really important contribution um, and I'm hoping that when we get this SharePoint site up that um, we can incorporate data from Canada and make it available to people in Canada as well as the United States, not just a Forest Service thing, um, but I'm not sure about that. But once the data is together, um, it should be easy enough to um, be able to move that to other sites if we can figure out where that would be. Um, and, and so um, I do think that that, that this um, sharing of data has been a key piece of what the LTSP study has been about. And I think that was part of the vision that Bob Powers had at the very beginning. Um, and that was to make sure that, um, that this study continued for as long as we could keep it going and that we would be able to still have all of that data be available for people. And so um, with that, I don't wanna take all of my hour, although I'm getting pretty close, um, but I do wanna leave time for um, questions if there are any. And, and I also wanna say, um, if, you know, if you have any questions that we don't get to, you're more than welcome to send me an email and we can chat about whatever questions you might have. So I wanna thank you very much for being here today. Thanks so much, Deb. That was, that was a fantastic talk. Um, and the, the questions are pouring into the chat. So cool. I'll remind you that all to uh, the, the Q&A is, uh, is probably a better place to put your questions, but um, the chat is fine too. And uh, I do seem to have capacity to allow you to talk today, which is great news. So if you want to uh, ask a question out loud, uh, just put up your hand and uh, I will um, uh, unmute your mic. Um, I love the, uh, the, the, I think I was going to, I'm going to adopt as my motto, avoidance rather than mitigation, because I think, uh, I think that's so true in so many things. Yeah, right? um, okay, uh, from Terry Sherrick, have you investigated the effects of these treatments on plant diversity? Where there was, um, yes, um, the broad answer is yes. Um, on, on, I think almost all of the sites, um, most of the principal investigators do have data at 1, 5, 10, 15, 20 years of understory recovery with these treatments. Um, we noticed early on in the southern um, United States that if you really wanted to increase grass productivity under your stand, um, you could compact the soil and get a great grass uh, understory. Yeah. So maybe not the best thing, but yeah, um, most of these sites do have plant diversity data. Sorry about that phone call. That's okay. um, <laughs> uh, from Mike Saunders, any differences between conifer forest types and hardwood forest types? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, and, and some of that is, um, you know, like the aspen stands um, regenerated from sprouts. 
but on all the other sites we planted. So even the um, central United States where we had hardwood species, um, those were planted. Um, I, I can't, you know, I, I'm not as familiar with the Canadian sites, but I do know that they have aspen and jack pine on some sites. And so um, maybe if one of those people want to chime in about their um, hardwood sites, I, I would appreciate it. Oh, you're muted. Thanks. Yeah, so anyone has any comments regarding that that specific question, please uh, please add them to the chat and I'll call on you. Uh, Jody, uh, let me see, I'm just looking for Jody's name here. Jody Axelson, I think. In BC, there is interest in increasing the partial cutting in some systems as opposed to clear cut with reserves. Does LTSP tell us about how multiple entries impact compaction and soil productivity over time? Uh, there's one site uh, <laughs> in the southeast that um, has thinned their stand. Um, I have thinned my stand, um, at, it, but it's only the pilot site, um, and we didn't allow heavy equipment, so we did everything by hand. <laughs> um, and, and so that, um, it, that doesn't really inform the multiple entry thing, um, but that is a concern. And, um, you know, uh, it, there's a split in the LTSP group about should you thin your stand or not, um, or should you just let it age and decay. Um, and so some people have um, uh, multiple entries, some do not. And some stands um, haven't gotten to an age where you could actually go in and do um, the first entry into that stand for a commercial or non-commercial um, partial cut. Okay, thanks. Uh, Michaela, sorry, the names aren't fully coming up. Michaela Waterhouse, um, how can the lessons learned be applied to site preparation methods? Um, so I think um, one, uh, one site preparation treatment that had often been used here in Idaho when I arrived was um, bulldozing all of the organic matter into windrows and planting in the scalp. Um, some of that is um, we need to do um, large removal of the forest floor so we get um, natural seed regeneration. So this site didn't look at the natural seed um, regeneration piece, but um, you know, from the aspect of moving all of the forest floor off so it's easier for tree planters. I, I think that that's probably not the best way to go because we've seen these fall off in productivity with the lack of forest floor. Um, but I do think that it can inform that, you know, maybe um, a smaller scalp would be more efficient and leaving the organic matter around the scalp area where you plant the tree so that the roots would have access to that organic matter over time. Uh, Zyra Perez asks, have you evaluated soil carbon stabilization in response to forest management? So yeah, that's what my grad student's doing. <laughs> so stay tuned. <laughs> and it's only on the western site. So if you've got an idea for the east, I, I'd be happy to introduce you. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and Henry McNabb asks, what would you do different next time in terms of study design? Ooh. Um, it, I'm not sure I would do anything differently because these treatments were really designed to um, encompass that range of um, small scale um, things that you would see during a timber harvest. Um, and, you know, um, part of what we don't have is um, industry was really interested in fertilization, so they included that in theirs. And, um, you know, we um, we made a decision early on that th these affiliate sites do have some of the core LTSB treatments, but um, they were free to do other treatments. And in fact, um, I, um, a lot of us did ameliorative treatments that went along with our core treatment. So I, I pulled stumps and um, other people did fertilization and, you know, there were uh, other things that were, were going on. So um, I, I think that ability to add in extra plot treatments um, was helpful to kind of answer some of the things that we saw going on in our areas um, that would really help. Um, you know, I, you know, if you did this again, um, you know, the, there's still, um, you know, the DIRT study um, is still looking at organic matter removal impacts on forest production. So um, I think that that organic matter piece is still really interesting to think about and where's, um, you know, how fast do, does organic matter decay and replace itself on these sites with um, a variety of changes in productivity. Great. And I think I just got a very long text. Oh, uh, 
from Kim Chapman. Thanks for your presentation. I'm going out to help sample veg composition and abundance next week at one of these sites. And it's really valuable to have this bigger picture. I think this kind of presentation recorded and available easily would be really of value uh, to attract, inform new people to work on the LTSP sites. Even site, site visit vids would help put things in context. The virtual field tours, because this, like virtual field tours, because the sites are so different and, e uh, and each, I'm sure, has so much history. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like the idea of videos. It's the new world, right? <laughs> For sure. I mean, we can't get to every place. <laughs> Uh, I think that's uh, that's all we have for questions. Uh, give one last chance for people to uh, to add their thoughts. Um, and in the meantime, I'll say um, we have now a, a, a break till 12.30. Now, uh, Deb is um, uh, moderating a session this afternoon, uh, a soil session at, uh, at uh, 2.40 above and below ground linkages of forests and soil. So if this talk uh, was of uh, great interest to you. They might want to visit that session and, uh, and participate in that. I'm sure there'll be some really good discussion. Uh, that's a good group and uh, there'll be some good discussion there. Um, I, I have uh, understand that Chris Miller is uh, not well and won't be able to give his presentation today. So that's going to change the schedule just a little bit. The last two talks will be uh, moved up by about 15 minutes. Um, at uh, 1230, we have a special session on Northern Forests as Refugium, Insights from Tree-Assisted Migration Trials, organized uh, by Patricia Raymond and moderated by Allison Munson. And that's going to be in the Roberta Bondar building, uh, Roberta Bondar room, rather. And sorry, uh, the above ground bio, uh, and below ground linkages talk is in the Bondar room as well. Um, in the Superior Room, we have a special session titled Post-Disturbance Recovery of Forest Biodiversity After Harvesting and Natural Disturbance, and that's organized and moderated by Sung Il Lee. Uh, and uh, at 12.30 in the Huron Room, we have a session of contributed talks on disturbance ecology moderated by Sandy Ernie. And I did just receive an email saying that we are good to announce that uh, the NAFU 2024 will be in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. And if you've never been there, you need to go. It's a wonderful place. Um, and uh, I, I think I'll let the organizers send out uh, an email to let you know what the, any specifics on, on that. But um, yeah, that'll be, a, that'll be a great meeting. I'm very excited about that. Um, okay, again, ha have a great day, everyone. And thanks, thanks for coming out to uh, NAFU 2022. Uh, it's been fun. And see you at 1230. Thanks, Deb. Yeah.